Okay, so let's get started. Welcome. Our first case study today is going to be looking at developmental delays and um, autism in a young girl. We're going to um, our faculty again and where we're from, Dr. Bridge Mohan is from Boston Children's, Casey is from Stanford Children's, and I'm, I'm from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, in terms of disclosures, there will be some discuss, uh, discussion of some off-label meds um, in part of our pharmacology discussion, but otherwise nothing else. And our learning objectives today are pretty clear. We want to dig through and figure out a differential diagnosis. We want to learn about a, how we're going to evaluate. We're going to pull together history, physical, assessment findings, and then really look at how are we going to support and manage a child who has autism, and then look at some of our treatment approaches. So let's get, let's get started and meet Katie. Katie, I wish I could show you a picture, but she's fictional. Uh, she's a two-year-old girl who presents in your primary care clinic with speech and language delay. She's recently begun receiving weekly developmental services through uh, the local early intervention program. In your office, she failed her initial MCHAT screening, but her family decided not to go forward and do any other um, anything else at the time because her older brother had a few speech delays, and he's fine now. So you order an audiology evaluation because you have a child with a speech delay, and you schedule an appointment to follow up with her. I keep little notes over here so I stay on track. So you see Katie back in your clinic three months later. She's now two years and three months of age, again with her continued speech and language delay. Her hearing test was normal. Her mom is starting to be concerned about some behaviors. She is having huge temper tantrums. They can't take her out in public places. Um, she's that child who will bolt away and run off, or she'll have huge temper tantrums in public. And her early intervention team has mentioned to the parents, who now mention to you, that she does not have good eye contact and that she engages in self-directed behavior. So we're going to do our first quiz. So get your clickers ready, okay? Um, what we're going to, I wanna ask you the question, what is self-directed behavior? Uh, you will have 10 seconds to answer this. So um, A, bossy and directs the behaviors of others. B, tends to not respond to any types of social invitations or rules for behavior. C, or three, tends to behave according to her own impulses and desires. And D or B, or D or four is both two and three. So you can start. Okay, so 90% of you answered both two and three, so excellent job. Um, that would be the answer. So what it means is that the child does not respond to social invitations or typical rules for behavior, and that they tend to behave according to their own impulses and desires, more so than you would expect from a two-year, three-month-old. We're going to move ahead to our second quiz. We're going to keep you active and involved today. The next, the next question is going to be, what are we going to do next? So get your clickers ready. Um, answer one would be that you're just reassuring the parents, you know, this is just terrible twos. She's a little slow to warm up. Two would be that you're going to go ahead and um, administer another MCHAT, and you're going to do another just general developmental questionnaire, maybe the, P, uh, maybe the PEDS, maybe in ages and stages. Three, you're going to wait and see if it goes away. And then four, you can go ahead and order an MRI. So get your clickers ready, and you can go. Great, so 97% of you decided you were gonna go ahead and repeat the MCHAT in the office and then do maybe a general developmental screening. 
Um, that is the correct answer. Uh, at this point, I don't know that we have enough information to say, boy, we need to waste the resources to do an MRI, okay? We'll talk a little bit more and we'll make some decisions also about that down the line, but at this point, you want to know more developmentally about what's going on. So let's talk about some developmental screening tools. There are a lot of different tools that can be used. Um, we're just gonna say that in your general pediatrics office, they've got a big stack of ages and stages questionnaires and that's gonna be your first go-to. This is a nice parent or caregiver screening questionnaire. It only takes parents about 10 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes to complete. There are a total of 21 available questionnaires, basically covering children from one month of age all the way up through five and a half years. So as always, you're making sure that you pull out the correct questionnaire for the child's age. It addresses five developmental areas, communication, gross motor, fine motor, problem solving, and personal social. What I want to let you know is that the, there are some studies that show that that, that communication is really going to be one of our red flags. Um, delays in the communication uh, domain are going to be some real red flags for autism spectrum. This in itself is not an autism screener, but you can definitely pick up the language and the social skill delays. There is also the ASQSE. So this one for young, um, for children and young, uh, for infants and young children will identify social and emotional delays. Another possibility is pulling out the PEDS, um, which stands for Parents Evaluation of Developmental Status. This is another caregiver questionnaire. It's a nice screener. You can use it from ages birth to eight years old. Only takes five minutes to complete. This is a nice quickie for your office. Only takes two minutes to score. And what you'll see is that kids will score high, moderate, or low risk for developmental problems. So to understand developmental delays, we have to understand typical development. And so I, I put these up off of the healthychildren.org website. So for typical, I'm so sorry, I'll stand back a step, okay. <laughs> So in terms of cognitive development, our typicals would be object permanence. You hide something under the blanket. Surprise, it's still there. Um, they begin sorting shapes and colors. They're completing sentences and rhymes from familiar books or songs. They can build a tower of four or more blocks. They're beginning to show hand preference. They can follow a simple two-step direction. And they can name little books, uh, little items in a book. Oh, there's a cat. Oh, there's a dog. Um, in terms of motor development, they can stand on tiptoe. Be they're beginning to run, they're kicking, they're climbing on and off of furniture, and then they can descend and ascend stairs while holding onto a railing. They can throw a ball overhand, and then they're beginning to copy circles and straight lines. In in terms of social and language development, social development, they love to imitate and they love to pretend. They copy others, they really love to copy what their parents are doing. They show a lot of excitement around other children. They're mostly still engaged in parallel play around age two, but they are beginning to include other children. They're becoming more independent, me do it and then they do what they're told not to do. They're showing some of that defiance that goes with learning where your boundaries are in the world. In terms of la language development, they're gonna point to objects when you name them. Oh, show me, and they, they can point to it. Or they'll point to things in books. They know body parts, they know familiar names, they're using two to four word sentences, they're following simple instructions, and then they're repeating words that are overheard in conversations, which some parents can find a little bit distressing because they repeat everything you say. <laughs> the, next, uh, the next testing that, com that's, that we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna have Casey come up. The MCHAT is the Modified Checklist for Autism and Toddlers. Everyone should be using the revised version and the follow-up questionnaire. Um, it's a widely used, validated measure for children ages 16 to 30 months to evaluate risk for autism spectrum disorder. It's short, it's easy to administer and score. It should be used regularly at well-child visits. 
it does have high sensitivity and a high false positive rate. So if a child scores positive on the MCHAT, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that a child has autism spectrum disorder. It may be elevated for other reasons. Um, and it's very important to do the follow-up interview. That's skipped a lot, so we definitely want to have make sure that people are aware of that and do it on a regular basis. Um, here's information about the scoring. Um, for all items except for three, a response of no indicates a risk of autism spectrum disorder. For those three items, um, a yes response indicates risk. Um, and then it categorizes risk into ranges. Low risk is zero to two, no action is needed. Medium risk, the total score is three to seven. This is where it's really important to administer the follow-up questions. If the score remains two or higher, it's considered positive. And high risk, a total score of eight to 20. Um, it's important to refer for a diagnostic evaluation and early intervention services um, simultaneously. So here is Katie's original MCHAT at 24 months. Um, the positive items have red uh, squares around them, so you can count them up, one, two, three, four. So she has a total score of four. This is a fail. Um, it places her in the medium risk for autism spectrum disorder. The interview was not done, the family was not interested in pursuing services, um, and nothing happened at this time. So Katie returned, she is back. She is now 30 months of age, um, and here is her current MCHAT. So you can count up the items. Seven, eight. Here is another quiz. How would you interpret Katie's current MCHAT R? One, low risk. Two, medium risk. Three, high risk. Four, definitely has autism spectrum disorder. Get your clickers ready. Eighty-eight percent said high risk. Yes, she scored in the high risk range, um, so we do want to uh, pursue further diagnostic evaluation. Um, we don't know, she doesn't definitely have autism spectrum disorder, this is just a screen. And it's important to recognize the difference between a screening tool um, and a, a different, more thorough measure. A screening tool is a brief measure that differentiates children who are at risk um, from those who are not. Um, they help eliminate worries. They're very helpful at screening children out rather than necessarily screening children in. Um, it just identifies are you at risk, are you not at risk. Uh, it's the first key step in the diagnostic process. Um, it's very important to refer those flagged at risk uh, to diagnostic specialists for more extensive evaluation. So now you have another positive um, MCHAT. So what do you do at this point? How do you discuss your concerns with the family? Um, they weren't originally very concerned, so you can explain to them that the current screening continues to show concerns for Katie's language and behavior. It's nice to join with the family and recognize their concerns. They're reporting concerns with her behavior. It's affecting their daily life. They're having trouble going out into the community. Um, so what do we do about this? Quiz, what is your next step? Number one, wait until age three. Number two, get another hearing test. She had one, but maybe hearing difficulties are impacting her behavior. Three, refer for diagnostic evaluation. Four, you feel like you have enough evidence to diagnose autism spectrum disorder. Okay, 10 seconds. Ninety-nine percent. Okay, excellent. <laughs> yes, we want to refer for a diagnostic evaluation. Um, we definitely don't want to wait. Um, she's already had a hearing test, um, and it was normal, and we don't have enough information at this point to diagnose autism spectrum disorder. So it's really important when discussing your concerns with the family to tailor your approach to the individual needs of the family. Some families are ready to actually hear the word autism spectrum disorder. Other families, this might scare them away and they may not pursue further evaluation. Um, for this particular family, the pediatrician decided to be very careful. Um, they said, you know, we know we talked about a referral when Katie was two, there are still concerns. I would like Katie to see a specialist to get a better idea of what is going on and focus on the importance of therapy or treatment or options that would be helpful. Um, further down the road, sometimes it is helpful to use the word because it plants the seed and people can start thinking about it and looking it up. 
um, and learning more information, but it's really important to, to meet the family where they're at at that time. Hi, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what happens next when we go into the evaluation, but I just wanted to pull the group to get a sense of who our learners are. So how many people here are in doing primary care? Excellent. And how many people do specialties such as developmental behavioral or mental health, psychiatric? Great. So it seems like there's a lot of people doing both and then about even numbers in e each group doing uh, one. I need my glasses. So a number of different uh, professionals are qualified to make a diagnosis of autism, and it's important to know that if you're I the primary care provider making a referral. A number of uh, physicians, including uh, developmental behavioral and neurodevelopmental disability trained pediatricians, neurologists, and psychiatrists, and some general pediatricians also um, have training and feel qualified to make a diagnosis. Additionally, nurse practitioners and psychologists. And sometimes a uh, diagnosis will be made by a single provider and sometimes by a team of providers. Evidence shows that including information from multiple sources does increase the accuracy of diagnosis, and that, but that can be done in many ways. So other professionals will also need to be involved. We need to understand more about the communication skills, speech and language pathology. Um, occupational therapy and physical therapy may um, evaluate motor skills. And for older kids, educators may be involved, looking at learning disabilities, and sometimes other medical specialists, for example, a genetic specialist, depending on the presentation. Uh, and so the goal of the evaluation is really to clarify if the child is meeting the diagnostic criteria for autism, and then to also get an assessment of the child's overall development and what their treatment needs might be, and importantly, to evaluate if there's any other medical conditions or co-occurring conditions that are going to need to be treated. And just for any, does anyone here not know what developmental behavioral specialists do? Maybe we don't need this slide, but uh, we just wanted to make the point that DBP is really a broad field. Uh, we take a holistic view of the child, and we're really looking at a whole range of developmental conditions, behavioral conditions, attention and learning issues. Um, so um, that can all be assessed in the evaluation, depending on the individual child. So let's move on and see what happens in the evaluation. Katie comes in, and look at her age now, two years, six months. So this is six months after the concern was first identified. And unfortunately, that's often the time frame that we see. There are long waits to see specialists, and families are not always ready to go the first time you bring it up with them. Uh, so at this visit, Katie tells the developmental specialist, uh, uh, sorry, not Katie, her mother, um, <laughs> that she can't take Katie out in public because Katie won't stay near her mother and she's always running off. She also has huge temper tantrums. And Katie's mother says, her doctor's concerned about autism, but my cousin's child had autism, and Katie's nothing like that. But she does want to know if Katie's behavior is normal for her age. So in the history with the developmental pediatric specialist, you really need to look at getting a sense of the overall development of the child, but also be taking a history that's tapping into the uh, symptoms of autism spectrum disorder and thinking about the diagnostic criteria, which we'll review in a minute. So we want to look at language and social skills. And, and Katie's mother reports that she started talking at 12 months and said bye, but then at 18 months she stopped talking. And we do see this history in about 25% of kids with autism where they'll have some early language development and then a, a small regression. She now has 30 words, but they're pretty rote in quality and primarily used to ask for things she wants. It's a little atypical. For example, she's saying things like, ready, ready set, go, please and thank you, but she's not saying mommy and daddy. So that's kind of the quality of atypical development that you might get in the history. She's also not combining words yet, such as Katie want or daddy go. 
Parents also are now noting a lack of eye contact um, when talking to Katie. Remember, early intervention was noting that previously. Katie is also not looking up when her name is called, and she's not following simple commands unless they are things she already wants to do. And when Katie wants something, she takes her mother over to it rather than pointing or requesting. Uh, the social history is also concerning. Katie prefers playing alone, and that's often reported by parents of young kids with autism. When she's around other peers, she sometimes plays next to them, but she doesn't really seem to acknowledge their existence. Um, she's also not playing with toys in a way that the mom thinks is normal. So, for example, when she has a car um, truck, she'll look at the wheels on the truck rather than pretending to drive it around. And this kind of atypical play and focusing on parts of toys can often be seen in kids on the spectrum. So um, just to review what we'd expect typically for someone this age, as Beth mentioned, is a lot of imitation. Kids are learning by looking at the world around them and copying adults. They're often doing more complex imitation, like pretending to clean or cook or take care of a baby. Um, they show an increased range of emotions. They can express real subtle emotions like surprise or confusion. Um, they do, however, get very upset when things aren't following their routine. And we can see a lot of tantrums in this age group, and that can sometimes be hard to sort out. Is this normal, you know, quote, terrible twos, or is this autism? Um, Children in this age group are showing lots of affection. They've developed really nice relationships with their family members, with familiar friends. Um, but they're still pretty egocentric. They're focusing on my needs. And, and it's hard sometimes for them to understand why they can't just grab a toy from their friend. So we're coming up to our next quiz. So get your clickers ready. And this question is, what other areas of development should we explore now in our history? And the choices are behavior, motor, adaptive, and all of the above. Great, okay. Excellent job, so all of the above. So any of these answers would be right, but we really need to look at all of them. We need to delve more into behaviors, um, it's important to look at motor skills um, because those can uh, affect a child's uh, play and um, social skills. And then adaptive is very important, and a lot of kids with autism have real difficulty with their early adaptive skills because they're not cluing into social cues, and they also t oftentimes have less well-developed regulation for things like sleep and feeding. Great. So we're going to take a little more history and really focus in on behaviors, particularly any kinds of atypical behaviors that might suggest autism, like uh, behavioral rigidity. So Katie's mom has not observed any stereotype motor behaviors like hand flapping, spinning, or rocking. And frankly, this is a history we often get in younger kids with autism because they don't show those behavioral symptoms early on. But by age two, six, we often are seeing them. Um, but most of her language is stock or road, as we said, saying kind of these odd phrases, but not more socially motivated language. She has intense tantrums and gets very upset when they go out in public. Uh, we talked already about repetitive play and some atypical features on that. And then there are some sensory concerns. She gets very upset with loud noises. She's also very picky with eating. She only wants to drink out um, her milk from a bottle, and she refuses to try any new foods. Has anyone had a patient with that history? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Great. And then she's very active, and we'll often get this history of kind of intense hyperactivity and kids that are running around a lot, and they're not sitting and focusing on play in the way that would be expected at this age. Um, there's no history of motor delay for Katie. She's actually really doing nicely with walking and running, going up and down the stairs, and stacking blocks. But some of the more socially involved motor milestones and adaptive milestones are not coming online. She's not trying to dress herself. She's also not showing any interest in toilet training. And she's not self-feeding, and there seem to be two factors contributing to that. One, there's some motor issues with fine motor. She's having trouble holding and maneuvering the spoon. 
uh, but also some sensory issues where she doesn't want to finger feed because she doesn't want to touch certain kinds of textures. So I think we need to get a little more information about the behavioral functioning, and so Casey's going to talk to us about some questionnaires that can add to our history in the evaluation. So what happens when you go to developmental behavioral pediatrics for a specialty evaluation? Most people collect more detailed behavior rating forms. It's very helpful to get this information prior to the visit, if possible, or you can give them during the visit. Um, it's very helpful to collect information from multiple sources. These forms are only as valid as the view of the person who's filling them out. So it's very helpful to get information from multiple sources, such as caregivers and teachers or therapists. So these are just some examples of widely used rating forms. The first two, the CBCL and the BASC, are, they provide information about behavior in general, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, the next two, the SCQ and the SRS, provide information specifically about autism spectrum disorder symptoms. Um, and the last two, the uh, Adaptive Behavior Assessment System 3 and the Vineland 3 provide specific information about adaptive functioning, which is what we care about so much. You know, what is really important? How is this child functioning in the real world? So the CBCL is probably one of the most widely used behavior rating forms to identify problem behavior in, ch in children. Um, it's been, it, it goes across a wide age range from one and a half up to 18. There are different versions for caregivers and teachers. It's been translated into multiple languages. Um, it has excellent norms and good reliability and validity. So here is an example um, of, of what you would see after you give it and score it. Um, you know, these scores are a little lower than we would have expected for Katie, and that's because this is not Katie's. <laughs> This is just an example of what you would see. These are the syndrome scale scores. This is an actual patient um, the same age as Katie who did end up receiving a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. But you can see all of these scores are generally within normal limits. These are T-scores. Um, and the CBCL interprets anything up to 65 to be within normal limits. Emotional reactivity is in the borderline clinical range. And you can just eyeball it pretty quickly and see that nothing is clinically significant. And these are the DSM-oriented scales. Um, you can see autism spectrum disorder problems on there is also within normal limits. Again, you would never use this alone to diagnose autism spectrum disorder, but it's helpful to get information. And you can delve deeper and look at the specific questions um, that were um, endorsed or not endorsed in each area. So for example, under autism spectrum disorder problems, this person said that sometimes they don't answer um, or respond to their name. But this person is not that worried. The behavior is not that concerning. Here's another example of a widely used behavior rating form about general behavior, the BASC-3. Um, the age range is a little bit higher, um, 2 up through 21. Again, it's in Spanish and English. It's fast. Well, we like that these now can be administered online. You can send a link, and the family can complete it online and return it, and it's automatically scored. Um, they can send it to the teacher who can complete it and send it back, and again, it's automatically scored. So it's a very fast, helpful, easy way to get good information from multiple sources. And here again is another example um, from, it's not Katie, um, but it's from the same child that we saw previously. Um, and one thing that I do like about the BASC, it has the general behavior scales on the left, and on the right, it gives information about adaptive functioning. And again, it's very easy to eyeball. You can see that anything in white is within normal limits. These are T-scores again. 60 to 70 is considered in the at-risk range, and above 70 is clinically significant. So you can look and see that measures of attention problems and atypicality are in the at-risk range. Withdrawal is clinically significant. This child is withdrawing um, from other people. And then in the adaptive rating scales, you can see, if I can see, <laughs> Um, that social skills are clinically significant. So that's concerning as well, and there are some difficulties with functional communication reported. So we're going to have another quiz. Um, so it's fabulous. You get this information. It's returned. It's scored. So now what do you do with it? How do you interpret the results? The BASC-3 profile is consistent with one, no diagnosis, two, autism spectrum disorder, three, language disorder, four, global developmental delay. Okay, get ready.
this is a tough question. So yes, the majority still answered um, the way that we would have answered as well. Obviously, you need more information, but this profile su is suggestive of symptoms consistent with autism spectrum disorder. Um, there are elevations, so you are worried that there may be something going on. It's not no diagnosis. Um, more than just language difficulties are elevated. There are difficulties in atypicality um, which and withdrawal, which, which are not necessarily consistent with just a language disorder. Um, and again, it, it's not consistent just with goal developmental delay either, again, because of everything that's elevated. Um, so you definitely need more information, but now you're, you're worried about autism spectrum disorder. People ask all the time, which one would you give? Which is better, the CBCL or the BAS? You know, it's really a personal preference. Um, both have strengths and weaknesses. So I'm just going to highlight some of their strengths um, and weaknesses. <laughs> we all have both. The CBCL has a younger age range, which is nice. Um, you know, we see young kids. We, we joke that our five-year-olds are geriatric. Um, so it's nice that it goes down to a one-and-a-half-year-old. And it is translated into more languages, up to 90 languages. It only has the three-point Likert scale, which I don't like as much because people tend to choose the middle. Um, the BASC-3 includes adaptive ratings, which is very, very helpful. And I like that it focuses on identifying strengths as well as problems. The CBCL, the language is very problem-focused, where the BASC uh, it also identifies strengths. And it has a four-point Likert scale. And then you, people might also give some autism-specific questionnaires. Um, the SCQ is typically for ages four and up. Um, we're just going to show you one that, that was filled out for Katie as an example. There are different versions, the lifetime form and the current form. The lifetime form focuses on the child's entire developmental history, um, so it's more helpful when they use for diagnostic purposes. The current form reviews how the child is doing in the past three months. It can help with treatment planning and measurement of change over time. Here's an example of an SCQ. And this is a good example of how it's often completed. Um, the caregiver circles multiple answers. There are question marks. And um, you say, what do I do with this? So you can either go back, and if they're still in the office, then you can re-ask the questions and make sure they understand and give some examples. Otherwise, use your clinical judgment based on what you know about the child. Typically, if they're wondering if it's a no or a yes, typically it, it's probably a good idea to score up. Um, you can also score it both ways. In this case, it was scored both ways. And either way, uh, this has a cutoff score of 15. Either way, the score was 15 or above, suggesting that the individual is showing symptoms of autism spectrum disorder and a more extended evaluation should be undertaken. try to keep further away from the mic this time. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of move on with our developmental history um, and kind of hit birth history as well. So um, for our young Katie, mom was 33, dad was 54. This was mom's second pregnancy leading to second delivery. She didn't know she was pregnant until she was 11 weeks gestation, so she had a couple glasses of wine out with friends. Um, did undergo some prenatal testing given uh, being over the age of 30 and the alpha fetal protein and her prenatal ultrasound were both normal. Went into labor 38 plus weeks, emergency C-section due to presence of nuchal cord. APGARs were good at seven, uh, at one and five minutes, the newborn hearing screen was passed. Little postnatal jaundice, but she didn't need any phototherapy and she went home on day three of life. So next, um, has she had any hospitalizations, any surgeries or accidents? So she's never been overnight in the hospital or had any surgeries. A couple minor ER things for a little vomiting, dehydration due to viral gastroenteritis. In terms of her sleep history, and I take a really thorough sleep history, she does have a lot of difficulty winding down to fall asleep at night. So her parent goes into bed with her and lies with her until she dozes off. That can take two or three hours some nights. Um, and then she'll awaken crying during the night and can't soothe herself. So her parents, they're exhausted. They bring her to bed with them. She's definitely awake one or two times a night, and then she wakes up on her own at 5 a.m. So since she doesn't sleep well, the family doesn't sleep well. In terms of the family history, her six-year-old brother we mentioned had a language delay. He had grew it. Mom had a history of some postpartum depression with the first child, and she also has a long-standing history for anxiety. 
Dad said that when he was younger, he was hyperactive. They thought it was ADHD. He outgrew it as he got older. And then just a little further out, there's a maternal second cousin who has Down syndrome. The remainder of the family history is non-contributory. In terms of social history, both parents are working. Mom just works part-time. Um, the immediate family lives out of state, and she attends a private daycare two days a week. Um, their financial situation is okay, but not great. Um, the daycare has expressed concern to the family about behaviors. Now we're going to move on and do our physical exam on Katie. And you're looking at her growth parameter. She's hanging around the 35th percentile for weight and height. Her head circumference is a little big at the 90th percentile. She was really fussy with the exam. But if you did all your things where you examine mom first and then you move on to Katie, and she really seemed to calm down a little bit. You let her hold your stethoscope. As you do your exam on her, you do not see any dysmorphic features. Her um, physical exam is normal. A little bit of hypotonia in her extremities, nothing too major. And then you pull out our trusty Woods lamp, and you see no neurocutaneous markings. So who does Woods lamp exams on their kids? Very little. And I want to talk a little bit about why the Woods Lamp is, exam is important and why this is also, and why this becomes important for our patient that we're working up for autism. So um, these are some possible skin findings. And what you can see on the far left is a child's uh, posterior calf. When you Woods Lamp it, do you see that hypopigmented patch that comes up? That is an ash leaf spot. This is associated with tuberous sclerosis. And TS is a genetic uh, disorder um, with mutations in the TSC2 gene. The prevalence of autism in patients with TS is estimated at about 61%. So you would not have picked that up to the naked eye, and it is important that you do the Woods Lamp exam. On the right, we see a hyperpigmented macule. This is a cafe au lait macule associated potentially with neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, neurofibromatosis type 1, there is an almost 25% increase in autism diagnosis among children with, uh, with NF. In addition, the f there, there are about, I think, let me look, I got to look down, 46% increase in an autism phenotype. So maybe not full diagnosis, but your skin exam and using that Woods lamp is very important. I gave you a very nice hyperpigmented macule, but sometimes these are in a fair skin child are only going to show up with your Woods lamp as well. And then we're going to go back to some assessment tools that we're going to pull out now. Now you get to pull out your bag of tricks. Um, I typically give the child some toys to play with while I'm talking to the family and the caregiver, and then I put those toys away, and then it's time to pull out more toys. Um, the Bailey is a gold standard for evaluating development in young children. Um, it goes from ages one to 42 months, um, so up to three and a half. Katie is two and a half. She's right at that age range where technically she could be given the young version of the Whipsy. But in Katie's case, she's young, she doesn't have a lot of language, we're worried that she's lower functioning, um, so we decided to give the Bailey because it would provide more information. The Bailey provides a wealth of information. Um, it provides information about cognitive skills, language, and it separates it into receptive and expressive language, motor skills, fine and gross motor skills. And then there are also caregiver questionnaires that you can complete. Um, questionnaires about social emotional functioning. This was developed by Stanley Greenspan. And then there are measures of adaptive functioning. The questions are based on the ABAS-2, so don't repeat it if you've already given the ABAS-3. Um, and also it's really helpful to see how the child interacts in a structured setting. Um, how does the child do attending to adult directed tasks? Um, the Bailey moves quickly and it, it covers a lot of material and you're constantly giving a child a toy and then taking it away. So it gives you a very good opportunity to see how the child does with transitions. You get a lot of behavioral data as well. Um, be aware that the Bailey 4 is being normed right now. They're collecting normative data through 2018. Uh, we're very hopeful that it will be released um, sooner rather than later. So here are Katie's Bailey 3 standard scores. 
Um, we're going to talk more about what standard scores are this afternoon, but you can look at this and see that in the cognitive domain, she scored in the significantly delayed range. Um, language was also significantly delayed. Motor skills were a strength and within normal limits. And the Bailey separates um, these domain scores down more. So you can look at the scaled scores. Um, cognitive was at the 18-month age equivalent. It's really nice that you can give these age equivalents uh, to caregivers so they can better understand where their child is performing compared to other children their age. Um, Katie is displaying difficulties with both receptive language, what she's understanding, as well as expressive language, how she can communicate verbally. Um, and again, fine and gross motor skills are both within normal limits and strength. So we've given our test, we have our scores, now we need to think about what this means. So Katie's Bailey scores demonstrate one, autism spectrum disorder, two, cognitive delays, three, language delays, four, motor delays, five, two, and three. Okay, get your clickers. Yeah, so the majority of people did say two and three. Um, that is correct. The Bailey did identify delays in both the cognitive and language domain. Um, some people did say autism spectrum disorder because you did see a lot of behavioral difficulties during testing that were consistent with autism spectrum disorder. The Bailey wasn't designed specifically to diagnose autism spectrum disorder, so I would not use those scores um, to, to suggest a diagnosis. Okay, we're going to talk more about um, the specific DSM-5 criteria for autism spectrum disorder. Great. So while, sorry, I'm moving over here so I can see everybody. Um, so while we're conducting our evaluation, we're taking a history, thinking about the diagnostic criteria, and then we're doing testing and we're making observations to see if we're observing any of the signs and symptoms of autism. And the DSM-5 criteria were developed in 2013 and really focus on um, impairments in two major functional domains. So to make a diagnosis of autism, you're looking at a child who has impairments in social communication and social interaction, as well as a pattern of restricted and repetitive behaviors or behavioral rigidity. And so what does this look like? Under the first domain, there are three different areas of functioning. So uh, social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, and then uh, developing maintaining and understanding social relationships. And to meet criteria, you actually have to have impairments in all three of the, these functional domains. Now what's challenging is that what the symptoms look like is gonna be different in children who are at different ages as well as different developmental levels of functioning. So what is social emotional reciprocity? Well, that could be playing peekaboo or it could be having a conversation. So you really have to taper your questions and your observations thinking about the cognitive and language level of the child and that's why the Bailey score is so important. In nonverbal communication, there are often impairments in using eye contact and gesture and also inter interpreting the information that other people are giving you through their nonverbal communication. And finally, developing and maintaining social relationships. Well, this can uh, range from a younger kid who may play by themselves and not really show interest in peers like Katie is doing, but older kids may be interested in peers but not really fully understand what it means to have a friendship. They may not understand the difference between a friend and an acquaintance. They may not fully understand what's going on and how to interpret a social situation. So you really have to understand that it, this can really present in a number of different ways. And then with the restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, there are four different types, and you have to have impairment in at least two of these four. And this can include um, the classic stereotyped movements, such as hand flapping, toe walking, rocking, your body back and forth, um, stereotyped speech, like scripting or echolalia. Uh, the second category is um, really resistance to change, insisting on sameness, and this often presents with severe tantrums, and that's what we hear the most when we get a toddler who's coming in for question of autism. 
but as we'll see later in the case, sometimes that pattern of behavior can persist as you get older. Um, also, restricted interests. This is another one that's a little hard to elicit in a very young child, but as kids get older, they may have very unusual over-focused interests, and they can be developmentally appropriate, like a toddler who loves Blue's Clues or Thomas the Train. Um, or it can be rather odd, like a, a child who came to my office and kept asking me what kind of ceiling fan I have at my house and what's the model number on the ceiling fan and knew the whole catalog of the <laughs> that they had uh, at home. Um, and then uh, sensory symptoms were a new addition with DSM-5. This was not present before, but children with autism have a lot of trouble um, both tolerating different kinds of sensory input or they may seek out sensory input in an unusual manner. So they may have trouble with noise, with food or clothing textures. They may seek input by kind of running and crashing into things a lot. So that's a really important one. And again, you need two out of four. And this domain is really challenging when you're seeing kids who are younger, like 18-month-olds. They may not show sufficient symptoms in this domain, and that becomes a controversy where if you clinically really feel strongly that the child has autism, what do you do? So maybe we'll discuss that in our Q&A. All right. And then with the criteria, you also need to try to make some kind of rating of the severity of symptoms. And you do each domain separately, so the child is getting two a severity rating for social communication and one for behavior. And it's really based on the level of support that they need. With level one, they need support, and level three is really needing very significant support. They're not doing a lot of these skills without constant prompting and structure. And then in an attempt to really better explain the heterogeneity of presentations in autism, the DSM-5 criteria added this extra category of specifiers. So you need to you need to consider and document the child's cognitive function and language function, and that's really important. You can't interpret symptoms without knowing the child's cognitive skills. Um, you'll also need to consider any associated medical conditions or mental health conditions. So I hope you're getting a sense of how complex it is to diagnose autism. I think that's why you're here, because you know that. Um, but we're really looking at patterns of behavior and the spectrum means that there are just so many different presentations. And we always like to say, if you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. And so Katie's mom's concern earlier in the history that, oh, she doesn't look like any child I've seen with autism. It, yes, that's true, because she's her unique presentation. Um, the other thing is that there's, w unfortunately, there's no one symptom that's predictive or diagnostic. So you really have to do a thorough history and careful behavioral observation. As I've mentioned, the symptoms change with the age and developmental level. And the final thing that's really challenging is that um, they're in the differential most of the conditions share some symptoms with autism. So kids with ADHD may not have great eye contact, for example, or may have some difficulty picking up on social cues because they're not attending at the moment that their friend looked annoyed at them. Um, so that can be challenging. And then conversely, all of the things in the differential also can occur comorbidly. So you're often seeing a child who has multiple diagnoses. And this slide just kind of is a nice, um, visual representation of that. And this is uh, from the Autism Speaks website and shows the symptoms of autism. This was actually from DSM-4, so you'll see they included language in there. Um, but clearly, kids with autism frequently have language delays. The reason it's not currently specifically in the diagnostic criteria is that language delay doesn't discriminate between autism and not autism. Um, but it's a common co-occurring symptom, as well as mood issues sleep problems, attention problems, and seizures. So thinking about in a young child, the really the early red flags that you want to be attuned to are deficits in early social milestones. So making eye contact, using gesture. So young kids should be pointing at around nine to 10 months, and kids with autism are often not pointing. Not responding to name. This is actually the most predictive symptom in a young child. Um, not showing and sharing, not gesturing. And then any kinds of atypical features like regression in skills um, or un uh, in language skills or unusual play skills. 
All right. Oops, I'm going to go back. Oops, I'm not, it's not letting me go back now. Go back. I hope I didn't mess us up. Okay, so our next slide is a video. So we're going to look at a couple of videos. Some of them are on the CDC website, um, and you have the links in your um, notes so that if you want to look at more of these videos after the session, you, you can do some additional um, exploration of the website. But we're going to first look at an 18-month-old boy who is not responding when his mother calls his name. And I want you to kind of look at what is he doing and what is he not doing. Evan. You want to try to see if you can get him to respond to it? Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Evan. 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 See maybe if you can get him to respond to you now you can use touch with his name, like give him a little tickle or something. Evan. 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 He likes the tickles, but he's just not giving you too much eye contact, but he does smile when you tickle him. Evan. 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 So it's a pretty sobering video, right? And you can imagine for a parent experiencing that. I mean, what a fabulous mother to share that video with us, but um, what did people see that he he was and wasn't doing? Any, yes? Yeah. So he's mouthing objects. Is that normal at his age? But he shouldn't be doing that. And it could be some kind of unusual sensory seeking, not responding to mom. Did you notice what he did when she tickled him? Yeah, he smiled. What did he not do when he smiled? Right, he didn't share it. So we really didn't see that shared affect and that's a, a marker of really not understanding or, or engaging in social relationships. All right, so for our next slide, we're going to see twins who are 19 months old. The first twin does not have autism. The mother is playing with him. She's rolling a car back and forth. He's delighted. He's taking turns with her. He comments when the train falls off. Uh, he, she goes, uh-oh, and he says, off. Um, and it's just a delightful interaction. And then immediately after, uh, she does the same thing with his twin brother who has autism. And you'll see much less facial expression, no animation. He pushes the car, the train one time, but then immediately gets distracted. And he's really more focused on the train as an object than, as, than on its trainness, if that makes any, any sense, um, and with other things in the room. Yeah, so Benjamin is just so engaging, you're drawn to him in the background, right? Uh, so this just shows them side by side. So you can really look at the facial expression differences here. All right. Um, now, so we've looked at a couple videos of really young kids, and I think that you know, sometimes in that age, the impairments are so obvious, and uh, those kids would definitely flag on the screeners that Casey reviewed. Um, but when we get higher functioning kids, they actually can be missed on those early screeners. They may be making eye contact and having some early appropriate language development, 
Um, but they'll often present with those behavioral symptoms of rigidity and frequent tantruming, and then also concerns with attention and anxiety. So in preschoolers, they're often not engaging a lot in pretend play or interactive play with peers, and I mentioned they may have some really odd interests. And school age, they're often interested in making friends, but they don't know how. Um, and they, are, they have trouble with conversation. They can also be pretty concrete and literal, and this often leads to social misunderstandings. Um, and then trouble understanding emotions and relationships. Um, so we're gonna look at the, um, the next video to just see a sense of what does behavioral rigidity look like in an older child. So we're gonna see a four-year-old who's at home and he's watching his favorite TV show, but it's time to go to the school bus. And mom tries to get him to get dressed and you can imagine how happy he is with that. Um, his sister's in the background and you'll get a sense of her frustration and just get a sense of what is the impact on the family, you know, day in, day out. And we're thinking about Katie's case with the sleep issues and, you know, how, how much, how well equipped are parents to deal with ongoing challenging behaviors. I might pause this early because he just screams a lot and it's hard to listen to. You'll see he looks really tense and apprehensive because he doesn't want to get that coat on. says, leave him alone, I'll take care of it. So the sister was trying to help. She's completely frustrated. just put a pause to that. <laughs> so we can just pause it, but his mom has to deal with that. And we'll, so you can imagine a number of things that are contributing to that. Uh, so he's having an, un, you know, an undesired transition. And there are several things we could suggest to this family, such as uh, perhaps having a timer, perhaps not doing the favorite video right before you know the bus is coming using visual schedules, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on uh, in, as our case evolves. Um, but how do we figure out this issue of is this a tantrum or a meltdown? You'll hear a lot from families about kids having meltdowns, and I think it's important just to understand a little bit about some of the nuances. So in a tantrum, a kid is still actually in control. They, are, they want things their way and they're expressing their frustration, but they're still able to monitor and they're looking to parents and, and trying to see what the response is going to be. And once they reach their goal, they're happy and the tantrum stops. But with a meltdown, we're really moving into something different where a child has really lost control. And so even um, they're not really checking in to see what's going to happen. They're not able to tune in to parents. And even after the situation resolves, they may still be distressed and crying. And so you really need different strategies. You can use really structured behavioral approaches to address tantrums, but you may need to consider additional measures to promote coping skills or other strategies if it's really a meltdown.